Here, the Lunara Connect, just after your keynote, and you were talking about uh, ARM taking over the future of CERN or not? Not yet. Uh, not yet. Yeah, investigating multiple architectures, whether that's uh, new flavors of x86, or that's a 64 bit ARM, or it's even a power PC. We are looking at multiple options and how potentially we could solve our problems when C is going to go into high luminosity you see on the 10 years of implementations. So, who are you? I'm David Abdrahmanov. I work at the University of uh, Nebraska Lincoln and I also started uh, to a CMS experiment at CERN. And we're here at the Grand Budapest Hotel right here in uh, Budapest. Yes. And uh, is it interesting to be at the Linar Connect? Always. With your uh, friends, right? Colleagues? Exactly. So, who are you? I'm Jakob Bloma. I work in the scientific software group at CERN. So, uh, scientific software, that, that's like uh, Scientific OS or what is it? That is, uh, that is tools. We are tool makers. We build the tools that help physicists making sense of the data. So how do you work together? What's the kind of uh, collaboration that you do? Uh, we work on uh, different things. Um, so again, I'm experiment, so we work on an experiment software. Same applies to Jaffer from Atlas, and uh, Jack Jakob is uh, working on more of infrastructure side. So he is uh, providing the we distribute the file system to distribute our software and our data, also the environment, virtualized environment we could actually run our software. So do you do uh, physics? Yes, I'm a PhD student um, at the University of Göttingen, but based at CERN right now. And we essentially use their innovations for our experiments. David's so experiment. you're Joshua Smith? Joshua Smith, yes. And uh, uh, so do you work on finding the meaning of life and Higgs boson and uh, one, parallel universe and all these one things? One could say that, yeah, yeah, in a sense, sure. <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you, it's very important to get uh, lots of computation, right? You can't just do a... a, a, a why do you need so many computers to do all this stuff? Um, so the amount of data we collect is not so small. So um, if you look at the current situation in 2016, uh, we have about 75 petabytes of data recorded. And uh, out of those 75, about 50 of that, 50 petabytes of that at least the experiments. And if you look 10 years or 11 years forward, what you call the high luminosity of CIM, we, we, say, we see that the first year is going to be an exabyte scale problem. We plan to have about 50, 600 petabytes of raw data and about 900 petabytes of data and derived data from that raw data as one single copy. That's a lot of hard drives. It is. But not everything is being stored in the hard drives. Some of that data is going to be sitting on the tapes. So uh, do you guys work with ARM servers? You're testing them out, right? You've been doing that for a while. Yes. Um, so in general, uh, at CERN, uh, I think it was the LHCB experiment, the yeah. Atlas experiment. LHCB. LHCB, LHCB yeah, started. I think we have we started it in 2013, and even before that, we looked mm -hmm. at the ARMv7 solution, that's the 32-bit version, also known as AR32 mode at this point. And CMS joined also in 2013. We did ARMv7 port, and then we quickly moved to 64-bit world, even before we could have a hardware. So we started from like ARM foundation models. And I guess now more or less every experiment is looking into alternative options. Yeah, it's something that each experiment needs to worry about, right? Is, is our computing needs as, as we try increase our energies, not try as we do increase our energies. It's, it's constantly on our minds. It's, it's, it's increase in power, in, in increase in computational needs. It's, it's always in the forefront. So how much, why do you need so much computation? Well, the processes that we want to study in the, in the physics world, in the standard model, in beyond standard model physics are so rare that we actually need just this huge amount of data to be able to spot, well not spot, but to be able to pick out the interesting events. So we actually throw away most of the data that we collect and we, we only store 0.000001% of it. Um, and it's in this that we hope uh, is something interesting. And so to do this is a high computational need. Is there AI and crazy algorithms to figure out what to keep, what to throw out? Oh yeah, um, AI is something that's um, kind of exploded in the last year or two years, I don't know. Um, it it's, hasn't been used uh, hugely yet, I would say, at CERN. Um, but it's definitely something that's making more of an appearance. Are you working on that? Not directly. What I see is that there's a lot of uh, algorithms being used that are called by some people AI. And you know everybody has its own name for things. So 
Uh, we might call it differently, but in the end, it's the same algorithm. I mean, you see, you saw the pictures, you know, of tracks coming out of the detector, of uh, clusters when, when, you know, when they hit detector material and it showers. And, and to reconstruct all of this, you have, um, you know, you have a Kalman filter, you have a cluster finder. So all of this, you know, you could also call it AI algorithms. And uh, um, so do you work a lot on, on the, the software? And that's a big, there's a big part of, of CERN is uh, uh, software engineers, right? That is true. Many people uh, end up working in software. Yeah. Computer science is a big part of CERN. Yeah, we have, a, we have a good track record and a healthy relationship between the computer scientists and the physicists. And you need both. To tackle these problems, you need, uh, you need folks who understand the physics and you need folks who understand the computing. So uh, you, you are the computing guy? I'm, I come from the computing side, yes. And what's the huge, biggest challenge you have right now? How would you say? There are many big challenges. Um, well, one of the big challenges is that the, the technology cycles, they are much shorter than the, than the cycles of particle accelerators and particle detectors. We plan and think in decades, and we have to make sure that the computing system evolves with this, right? We have to make sure that the computing in 20 years is able to, pro, you know, to process what, what was designed by detector people you know, 20 years ago. So what do you think would be nice from Lenaro and from the ARM servers uh, to happen for this to be better? You need to have more data, so it's impossible to do it on x86, it's too much power, is that true or not? Is it one of the challenges? Not at all, not at all. Um, it, it's not impossible to do on 80, x86. The, the question is, is it perhaps more beneficial to do it on a, on a different architecture, I think is the main question. And, um, more affordable. More affordable, and, and one of the, the main, as a user of our computational power at, 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 at Atlas and CERN, I don't want to tell a difference. If I run a grid job somewhere around the world, I don't really care if it's running on x86 or ARM. And that's, I think, the biggest, um, the biggest uh, hurdle for ARM to overcome is that it needs to seamlessly work with everything that our computational model does at the moment at CERN. But is it seamless, right? Well, if Already? You would... If you, if you listen to people like uh, John Master from uh, Red Hat or Jim Perrin, who is also doing CentOS, and some other people, especially here at Lenaro Connect, you're going to see the same thing being mentioned. Now, it doesn't matter if you're an administrator or you're actually a user. They're talking about actually building a very boring system. You don't want to see any difference. Again, not, not different from administrator side, none of the difference from a user side. So it's a different architecture, but I still log like, into a system where I run my jobs, I you know, run my analysis, I do my histograms. And at the end, no one knows what's the architecture. You're on top of things when it comes to ARM stuff, right? You're checking it all out, and you have the first generation, and now you're really wait, looking for kind of like second generation, and Thunder X2 is going to be good, X-Gene 3, uh, whatever Qualcomm is doing, and all kinds of other things are going to be very exciting. It is very exciting. So again, we spend, uh, at least CMS spent almost, it's a fourth year for us to look into 64-bit ARM. Uh, our first partner, the first real silicon we got was APN McGene, that was a Mustang board. And we moved to, to HP Moonshot Systems, M400 nodes, we had some gigabyte systems, this is a Thunder Access, we have this is HGN1, so look at the HGN2s. So we we'll, you know that our software works, you know that the structure can also work. We're now thinking more of, you know, when can we get the right silicon? When you're going to get something which falls in exactly what we tend to buy, and I think that's approaching. I think that 2017, 2018 is a very important year for ARM. Or also, it's a year of a third generation and a first wave, third wave and a fourth wave of silicon. And then we need to start thinking how the plasma is going to look like. So again, it's not the silicon that you buy. Silicon might be ready. But then the <coughs> question is how is going to, the plasma is going to look like. And we buy the platforms because they're users. But has it been moving fast enough? Because every time it seems like, ah, it's just about to come, but and then you get it, then it's not good enough, and then you have to wait three years. So how does it work? I understand that. Could, I, I, do I you think it's fast enough, or do you think, oh, oh my god, they should actually have done things faster? We all like to things we move faster, and I'm going to say the same things. I mean, I always tell it's going to be very soon, three years. Now I'm, gonna tell, I'm telling you that 2017, 2018 is a very important year. Which is what we said in 2014. Yeah. And you know, in uh, two years, I might say the same thing. Um, but you're saying that if you right look, now it's happening, you're saying 2017, 18 is I good. I think it's a very important year. So there's still no market for 64-bit ARM, but I think what's going to be in 2017 and 2018, the silicons, not the platforms yet, 
those are going to be very important for the market. They might finally get into a position that it becomes something that you might want to buy, but it can yeah. depend on your workloads. Because right now what you have is just for testing. It is you're not, testing. You're not buying it's not production, thousands, so. you're not buying millions. Of, no. But you're waiting for something that might be a candidate, potentially, and suddenly there's a switch. Yes. I guess and then you recommend to all these 170 countries, or how many people are participating, uh, institutes, so we that do, maybe they should be buying, ordering this, and because it works. So we do investigations, again, we look at the performance, we look at the power efficiencies, power consumptions, we look at the densities, on different vendors, different systems, different silicons, and we make that both as an analysis in the conference. You can see the posters, you can see the papers, and you know, it's up to the computer sensors, we can actually find it, and if we want to use that, you know, that's, that's beneficial. The thing is that an external computer center as a resource should not, they should not be restricted to a certain architecture. And so CERN's goal here is to be able to just deploy their software and not have to worry about this. And that's what this research will enable when a software center looking to buy some hardware doesn't know what they're going to buy. They can look at the papers, they can look at the white papers, and they're not restricted. And if you look at the projects, so again, there is one big project in Barcelona, one blank project, where there's going to be a third revision of that. This is going to be, again, powered by, by Finder X2, I believe, that's what he picked. Uh, and they also, Barcelona Spirit announced that you're going to have a system that's going to be a mixed one. So you're going to have x86, 64, you're going to have power, power PC based system, and going to have 64 with ARM. You talking about supercomputers? Yes. Yeah. I, I'm talking about the clusters. If you look at the Japanese, they're also going to be, the Fujitsu is actually want to build an exascale system based on ARM V8, where HPC silicon is being designed in China. So you can see that, you know, it's, Different regions might do different things, and we it's very broad. For this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it comes, we want to be ready uh, to run our programs there. And it's going to be super stable, and Linar is helping to all the stuff that needs to be done, like uh, all these. Uh, yeah, we hope so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> kernel yeah. support and all the all yeah, the stuff. All, all of yes, this is necessary. Uh, yeah. All of that is a lot of work. And then yeah, it's, it's something that CERN doesn't necessarily have the manpower to do. So the fact that there are. Um, there are companies, there are organizations out there doing this. It's just fantastic for CERN. When you talk about China, for example, are they doing uh, supercomputers on their own kind of architecture? Is it similar? Is it related to ARM? Or is it ARM also? There's a bunch of stuff happening over there. They so they're making the biggest ones for some reason. Yes. We, as far as I know, we have the most powerful supercomputer at this point. And then in general, in terms of how much supercomputers have, we actually have more than US at this point, I think. And Can you hook up to it and use it? I personally cannot, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, they also want to build an exascale systems, and we, you know, we just recently announced the latest supercomputer, which is not an x86 system. They actually have their own custom silicon, which has amazing, I think, more than 200 cores at this point. And they do have research programs, if I believe correctly, and they're investigating different architectures for the next generation supercomputer, and I think our ARM V8 is for a bit is actually part of one of those systems to be investigated. Maybe uh, one way that all this can actually happen is not just uh, awesome software, but products like this need to be running on ARM because it's related to servers, kind of, right? You, you, you want to get something bigger than a smartphone chip. I can only provide you a personal view on this. <laughs> um, as a software engineer, I would like to live as an instruction set that I am working on. So if I need to work with, on a 64-bit ARM instruction set based software, and I would like to have my daily driver running the same instruction set. There needs to be a um, non-part Mac. And there's going to be a talk again on Friday here at Lenaro Connect discussing about exactly this issue that majority of ARM developers still using x86 64-bit uh, 64 systems for doing ARM development. So how do we change that? So there's a new owner at ARM, and uh, it's, it's, it's supposedly is huge, and they could have huge amount of uh, funds, and maybe uh, China, maybe uh, Trump, I don't know. But uh, is, is, there, is there a need for much more uh, investment in, in stuff like CERN? What could you do if you get like 100 billion more? I, that's a very difficult question, and starts <laughs> going into the politics of how CERN's run, and I don't think any of us should can answer that. We <laughs> could definitely do a whole lot more physics. I mean, yeah, I mean, more money, more physics, more could look into resources. Rarer processes, could, could collect more statistics. I mean, having more money is never a bad thing. Um, but yeah, those are very difficult. How did you pursuits. find the Higgs boson? That was on x86, right? <laughs> that it was all processed on the existing infrastructure. 
Uh, yes, so uh, our grid is, is based on CPUs that are, I don't know, more than 10 years old in lots of places. And so this is all x86 or AMD. And yeah, it was just a brute force search with some very smart analysis methods um, that were used to find the Higgs boson uh, fundamental and, particle. And proving that Einstein was right or no? That this was is not, a different thing. Else. This is a different else, thing. Right? Yeah, this is, this is unrelated. It just put another... It, it confirmed our standard model once more. Our theory is very good, but it's not complete. Is it fun to... I, uh, so do you live around CERN, all three guys? You all over there in Geneva area, yes. right? Yeah. And so is it a bunch of fun people over there, like really weird physicists, uh, particle physicists, and uh, they have like crazy big uh, visions and they want to do stuff and they get to do I'm, stuff. I mean, there is the best thing, best thing you can do is you can come and visit us. Uh, we have 100,000 visitors a year and we are happy to show everybody who passes by, uh, you know, everything we do uh, and we have. There's, there's tour groups, you can, you can go down to the detectors when the beam isn't running, obviously. Um, there's, there's guides that will take you around CERN and CMS, Atlas, Atlas, LHCB, there you can get detailed information on all of these. And there was kind of like a second run, what do you call it, when you rebooted everything and you got things uh, faster, double the energy, but also what did you do in terms of uh, uh, the, the IT infrastructure? You also reset that, right? Was that part of your presentation? We did have some changes. Again, CERN runs in what you call, and we have runs. So, you know, when you announced the Higgs boson, that was based on around one data, if I remember correctly. And when they shut down the detector and they had the long shed of one, which lasted about 18 months, and now we are in two. So, again, we have updated the accelerators, we have updated the detectors, we also had time to work on our software and infrastructure to make sure that you actually can handle the amount of data that's going to be coming out of these detectors. Um, we're going to work till the end of 2018 and we're going to have another two-year-long shutdown period. We're going to again upgrade the hardware and start thinking of how to optimize our software. Um, so, uh, so end 2018, you say? Yes, it's end of 2018. two years? Yeah. Yes. So uh, more, more or less, even a few more months. Or less. Yeah, <laughs> it can shift, but, <laughs> it's, uh, but that's the, the plan. Right, and afterwards, two of the four experiments will have a big computing upgrade, uh, LHCB and LS. And then the following run, run four, CMS and Atlas will have their big computing upgrades. Are there lots of arms, uh, ARM chips in, in the CERN? Like in the state, I guess there has to be lots of microcontrollers in every Everybody's smartphone. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, excluding yeah. smartphones. Um, and hard drives, yeah. you know. And you have ARM chips from all small ones, core and, uh, and zeros and everything else, the microcontrollers. Both are in multiple products. You know, even you have servers, you might have your system running, you know, by small chips, ARM chips, and stuff like that. It's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's impossible to avoid yeah, ARM yeah, at this it's, point. It's... So, do you think ARM is a, is a perfect ecosystem, or could it be better? I don't think anything. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think it perfect is it. I think no. that it's a fun thing, no? Because like, there's so many companies. And it seems like there's a lot of potential for them to innovate, do something new. That's why we like ARM. Yes. That's, that's why we're doing the research um, that involves ARM because of this business model, because other industries can get involved and have their input. We can have our say. That's, that's why we really like ARM. It's interesting to try to follow the latest news, all the stuff that's happening, right? It's crazy. I think the news is just jumping you know, too fast. So you can see the TSMC, Global Foundries, new technology processes. The new silicon chip designs, the new systems being done, it's, it's very fast moving. Thing. And talking about uh, global foundries, let's say they have, and poly TSMC, they have this kind of thing where you can go and you can get your custom chip designed. Shouldn't you kind of go there and say, hey, we want a custom chip? No, that's not something you could do. I right? don't think it's. I don't think it's, I don't think it's <laughs> necessary to do that. Custom yeah. silicon in the detectors. I was going to say, yeah. You have a, you know, like many square meters of silicon for inner tracker and the detectors. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, custom-produced silicon only for this detector. That universities generally produce. Yeah, right? yeah, that is true. All right. So we'll see what happens. It's going to be interesting. And uh, thanks a lot. Definitely. Okay. Thank cool. You. Thank you.